Well, friends, listen, according to the Bible, we are on our way. And that's the title of our message today. We are on our way. You know, no matter who I'm speaking to right now, the fact is that you are on your way somewhere, aren't you? You might say, well, I don't believe in God. Well, you're still on your way somewhere, friend. For those of you who do trust God, and there's a big difference to believe in God and to trust God, is the fact that when we trust Him, we're not leaving our brains, so to speak, out at the door and coming into a church service because we're Christians and we can't think. I would argue with you the exact opposite's true. In fact, I love this quote by Oz Guinness. The deep logic of God's truth can be expressed both in stories and in arguments, by questions as well as statements, through reason and the imagination, through the four gospels as well as the book of Romans. And that's well said, here's the reason why. No other book of the Bible, 66 books of the Bible, there's no other book of the Bible like the book of Romans for this reason. The book of Romans encapsulates the entire doctrine of God regarding salvation, redemption, and eternal life. There are two Testaments, the Old Testament and the New Testament. We all know that. But listen, the summation of the Old Testament is all wrapped up in the promises and then the answer from old to new. What the old records, the new reports on being fulfilled. Listen, grab your Bibles and let's get into this study titled, We Are On Our Way, because the truth of the matter is, my friend, you and I literally are on our way, every single one of us. And, and here's the tough part, here's the truth. Your atheism, if you don't believe in God, doesn't keep you away from the truth of God. You are on your way somewhere. I just hope you're on your way with us to God's eternal home called heaven. It's remarkable to, to realize that Paul the Apostle is speaking. I love this. Listen, Paul, one of the most zealous and powerful uh, witnesses of uh, the Jewish religion, Judaism, in the first century, who was a combatant to Christianity. Uh, it's well documented both in the Bible and in extra biblical writings, is that he was very zealous for his nation and for his brethren and for the law and for the regulations. And Paul or Saul of Tarsus was this very zealous man who was out with letters of authority from Jerusalem and in the council to hunt down Christians and destroy them. Some of them were held uh, captive. Some of them were arrested. Some of them were tried in courts. Some of them were killed on the spot. It's legendary. It's historic. And Saul of Tarsus was the chief. And um, yet God had a plan and interrupted his uh, antics and his persecution as he was heading up north to the Damascus uh, region on the King's Highway that is right between uh, Jordan and Syria today and Israel today, the King's Highway. It's in a valley, it's there, it's still there today. And he was on his way to Damascus to hunt down Christians there. And the Bible tells us in the book of Acts that Jesus Christ interrupted his plans and visited his life. And um, you can read about his life in the book of Acts, but he was absolutely uh, transformed. And when he understood, it's, listen, when he understood the Old Testament scriptures to say that they were teaching about the Messiah, well, that's obvious, but that the Messiah had come, that's not so obvious. So when he studied the Old Testament scriptures, he came to the conclusion that Jesus, we say, Yeshua, Yeshua, Joshua, we would say that name as well, that the Messiah has come according to the prophets. And for that, the very team he was on turned around and tried to kill him. And so to speak, now Paul, with his change of name, change of life, change of worldview, complete, can I put it this way? Radicalized for God in the right way, became a lover of men's souls. And he's been the greatest convert to Christianity. Uh, you know, historians say this. He's the greatest convert to Christianity the world has ever seen. Um, I want to believe that I've been the greatest convert to Christianity the world has ever seen because I'm the one that I'm concerned about regarding going to heaven. 
Does, does that make sense? I, I know what they mean. They mean his conversion has literally affected millions and millions, if not billions of people. Uh, my life, maybe your life may not have that effect, but isn't salvation personal anyway? Is it personal for you? It should be. The Bible says in Ecclesiastes 3.11, he has made everything beautiful in his time. Also, he has put eternity in their hearts. He's speaking about our hearts. Did you know that your heart, your life, your mind, your thinking will always go back to the fact that there is an eternal stamp by God in your making? You can go out and do all the things in this world and, and, and all that this world offers, and we've done it. Some of us have, it's been so long since we've been a non-Christian, we forget what God's delivered us from. We need to remember, not dwell on it, you know what I mean? Not go back and think about it, but remember enough about our pre-Christ life to remember how lost we were. You know how we talk up the stuff we did? Oh man, it was an awesome party. It really wasn't. (laughs) Oh, we had the best time ever, man. We did this, we did that. Yeah, we really talk it up. What the world offers is all glitter. And when you bite into it, there's nothing substantial there. You might wake up quickly to that, or you might take an entire lifetime to wake up to that. It doesn't matter when you wake up to it, as long as you wake up to it. That what this world offers has no way of sustaining what your life needs. Why? Because he's put eternity in our hearts. Every single one of us. And so church, we look at this. We're on our way. Number one is this way in verse 23, the heartbeat of heaven. The heartbeat of heaven is in our very making. The heartbeat of heaven. And you might say today, I don't believe in heaven. Well, you not believing in heaven doesn't make heaven not real. That just means at this moment, you're going to miss out on a very real place. We don't want you to do that. Just because you don't believe in God doesn't mean he doesn't exist. That's kind of funny. He actually exists, and he's written us his book, and he's stamped within our hearts this constant nagging question about eternity, about heaven, about judgment, about life, about death. What's beyond the grave? Job asked that question. Oldest book in the Bible, the book of Job. Job asked, if a man dies, does he live again? Isn't that great? By the way, if you read the book of Job, he gets the answer. He says, I know that I will see God in my flesh. What a response by Job. As Christians, we believe in resurrection. Maybe you're Jewish today. Uh, Muslims believe in resurrection. Uh, Much of the world believes in reincarnation. Um, Listen, the Bible is very, very clear. That resurrection is a biblical doctrine. And when Job said that, you got to remember, there was no Bible in Job's day. God spoke to him. And he said, I'll see God in my flesh. What a statement. Every one of us who are trusting Christ, we will see God in our flesh. Now, thank God in heaven, our flesh, this flesh is going to be reconstituted. We believe in resurrection. That means if, listen, if I'm laying here dead and the Lord calls us home in the rapture, my dead body is going to rise off the ground. It's going to go invisible. Why? God is going to change the structure of my atomic existence. He's going to change the collection or the assemblage of my material being. It's called resurrection. The Bible says the dead in Christ will rise first, and then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up to meet the Lord in the air. And that's where these movies come from and the books come from of a disappearance. It's true. There's going to be a disappearance. Some will disappear at his coming. Some will be resurrected from the dead at his coming. But the believer will be united with Christ in the atmosphere. What an amazing thing. And our hearts will rejoice because finally, if you're honest, if you truly know the Lord Jesus Christ, your heart beats with a hunger for heaven right now. He says in verse 23, Romans chapter 8, not only that, building off of the previous verses, but we, listen, we also who have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves groan within ourselves, eagerly waiting for the redemption, or the adoption, I should say, the redemption of our body. Very powerful portion of Scripture. Number one, church, jot this down. 
The heartbeat of heaven is this within us. Heaven's throne within us is God's proof. It's the proof of God in ownership of who you are, of who I am. According to the scriptures, God dwells in heaven, and we know this. But according to the scriptures, what is known as the omnipresence of God, the omnipresence of God is that by his Holy Spirit, God dwells everywhere. I mean, it gets kind of deep, but think about it. God is here now. For the believer, God resides within us, he says, but he's also seated upon his throne in heaven. That's beyond my comprehension. But this I know, that my heart inside, being a follower of Christ, he touched my life with what is called salvation. And I didn't feel anything the day I accepted Christ. Some people feel things. That's great. I didn't. I didn't, I didn't get goosebumps. I didn't get emotional. I was actually, I, everybody around me was crying and I thought something was wrong. What's wrong with me? What's wrong with me? I remember saying that. What's wrong with me? And um, somebody had to tell me, it's not by feelings, it's by faith. And, but this I knew, from the moment I accepted Christ, my mind began to think differently and my desires began to struggle with my previous desires. I grew up wanting these things and then Christ invaded my life and caused me to not have a struggle with those things because now I wanted the things of God. In fact, over time, and this is true, and many of you can say amen, that the more that the Bible gets inside of you, the more of your desires become his desires. The Bible says, delight yourself in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. That's an awesome verse. But listen, it's not a trick verse. Wait, what was that? If I, delight, if I delight myself in the Lord, you'll give me the desires of my heart? Man, that's awesome. Nah, that's not what it means. Well, that's what you said. It's, that's what, you just quoted it. I did, but that's not what it means. It means that if you delight yourself in the Lord, that means you fall in love with God. You care about what God thinks. You care about what God wants. That what you desire now are the things that God has always had for you to desire. It's just now you're listening. Now he's active in your life. Why? How is that true? Because he's enthroned in your heart. He's enthroned in your life. You see this word first fruits. Again, in most Bibles, it's one word. It's a, it's a difficult English word uh, or Greek word for us to put into English. So you see first fruits. Some of your Bibles might have first fruits divided. But the meaning of this, first fruits, is this, everybody. Talk about throne being on your heart. Look at this. The beginning of a sacrifice. He says this, regarding our new life in Jesus, that we are to be a kind of first fruits. The beginning of a sacrifice. First fruits out of the Old Testament, Leviticus chapter 23, means the first of what has been received. The first of what has been taken in. Or we would say harvested. The best, the most precious of that which you, which you have gotten in value or of worth. Meaning, God's given you this in life, and God says, give me the best back. I'm your God. Keep your heart level. Give me the cream of the crop, so to speak, okay? God says we're to be giving him the first of our increase, whatever that might be. But notice what this does. It shows us that there's the throne room of God in your life, that God is in control, and the evidence of the Holy Spirit in possession of your life is that this throne is set up and God begins to speak to you. And you basically come to this conclusion, Lord, I see that you want the first of all that's important to me, but now I see you want everything that is me. So somebody will say, well, God wants 10%. Somebody might say God wants 13%. Somebody, did you know that, um, and I forget his first name, but uh, you've heard of Procter and Gamble. The man Proctor, he said, Lord, he had basically nickels. God, I dedicate my company to you. I'll give you 90%, God, of everything I make. 90. So what he did was, <laughs> he started his company, and God had to bless it so the poor guy could eat. <laughs> and he lived his days like that, and of course, became an iconic global corporation. But he put God first. That's what he chose to do. But what's amazing about this is that when you think about it, that God actually owns everything that you and I have. And he even owns the air in which you and I are breathing right now. 
the fact that you and I know that as believers and that we think about him being in control of our lives is a glorious thing. We've learned this in scripture, which I think is amazing. The feast of first fruits, people write this down in your notes. When it says first fruits here in verse 23, first fruits, that's an Old Testament thought. In the seven feasts of Moses recorded in the scripture, and by the way, you may or may not know this, that in the Old Testament, which, listen, every Christian, as I say, you're probably tired of me saying this, every Christian should be studying the Old Testament like you study the New Testament. You don't separate them. You look at the old and what it says and what it promises, and then you look to the new to see when those things were fulfilled, given, or implement it. The Old and New Testament. And when you look at that, you realize that in God speaking to us, there's a priority that Christ is to be on the throne of our lives. Why is that the case though? Maybe you're here today and you're a skeptic and that's fine. The feast of first fruits, check this out, given by God to Moses to pass down to the children of Israel was a springtime feast, and we know this. On the Hebrew calendar, it is to be celebrated on the 16th of Nisan in the Hebrew calendar. They have, their calendar has different names than our pagan calendar, which places it, listen, two days after the feast of unleavened bread, so you you have you have the feast of first fruits. You take in the harvest. Then you've got two days later, the feast of unleavened bread. And then on the third day, you have the feast of Passover. You say, who cares? You and I do. Based on Leviticus chapter 23, 2,000 years ago when Jesus died, listen to this, Jesus Christ died three days after the first fruits of offering in Jerusalem. Two days after the Feast of Unleavened Bread. What does that mean? That God who promises the first fruits, meaning the best given to God first, Christ, according to the Bible, is the first one resurrected from the dead, never to die again. And because Christ is risen from the dead, you can know that you have eternal life because what he's done for us. And it's in direct correlation with God's revealed word through Moses. That's why over and over again in the Bible, the very one who occupies the throne room of your heart is the one who said, I am the resurrection and the life. I am the way, the truth, and the life. I am the bread of life. I am the living water. I am the light of the world, Jesus said. He made that announcement, and those are huge announcements to make. Because he's insinuating that I am the eternal one who gives you life because my offering is the bread of life. The word that I give you is the water of life. Think of it. Radical statements, right? You, gotta, you have to admit, don't let anybody in your life tell you, well, you know, I believe in Jesus. He was a great prophet. Really? Oh, he was one of the enlightened ones. You know, people try to... Jesus is too big to throw out the window, so they, re, they try to redefine him. So they give you some kind of a bogus excuse or definition of who Jesus is. Listen, I would argue this, and that's what J.R. Tolkien argued with C.S. Lewis. That's not true. The things that Jesus said, the things that he said to people, he said things that are crazy unless he performs these things. He says, if a man dies believing in me, he'll live forever. What kind of a lunatic says that unless you can pull that off? Are you hearing me? That's what C.S. Lewis Lewis responded and said to Tolkien, I believe Jesus is a good guy. Tolkien says, well, that's weird. Because the things that Jesus said, it demands a response. Everything that he said is so radical that he's either what C.S. Lewis said, a liar, a lunatic, or the Lord. Think of that. Very powerful statements he made. Well, the title of our message is something that I hope settles in, causes you to meditate on and think about because you and I, wherever we might live in the world, we get 
you know, in our car, airplane, boat, donkey, camel, doesn't matter where you live in the world. I've got to go from here to there to do this business or that. Or maybe you're moving. We're going to move from this location to the next location. Everything about what you and I do in life is that we are going from A to B. And then there's going to be a purpose for that. Maybe we are seeking some sort of uh, better life. Maybe we're seeking a better job. Maybe we're actually leaving something behind to go to something new and uh, an adventure. It doesn't matter. Every single one of us are on our way. And at the beginning of the program, I talked to you about the remarkable convert to Christianity, Paul, or used to be Saul of Tarsus, became Paul the apostle. Paul, no doubt, still to this hour, is the greatest convert the world has ever seen to Christianity. Brilliant in so many ways, and a man deep, deep, and steeped in the things of God. Jesus interrupted his plans on that road to Damascus. That road, by the way, today is occupied with people on it at this very hour. It's a highway. But listen, Paul was going somewhere. He was going from A to B. He's going from Jerusalem to Damascus, and Jesus interrupted his life. Listen, is Jesus interrupting your life? Are you starting to think more Jesus thoughts? God has put eternity in our hearts, the Bible says. That means you think about eternity, don't you? You think about forever. You might say, well, I don't believe in God. Listen, you may say that, but you wonder, don't you, if there's life after death. You know why you do? Because God put eternity in your heart. So God has put this eternity thought in us so that you might recognize God's call when he places it before you. When God says to you, why are you fighting against me? Why are you kicking against me? What have I done? God says in the Bible that you would turn away from me. I love you. I want to give you eternal life. I think you know what we're talking about. So friend, listen, if you want to know more, and I hope you do, you can go to jackhibbs.com and you can also connect with me on Facebook, Instagram, various social media sites. We would love to stay connected with you. But until then, my friend, stay close to Jesus. Stay with us as we take a journey through the Word of God together. You are watching Real Life with Jack Hibbs. One of the greatest gifts God has given us is a gift that we can give to others. But giving this gift is harder than it sounds. It's the gift of forgiveness. In a world filled with hurt and resentment, choosing forgiveness isn't easy. The weight of past grievances and the lure of bitterness weigh us down and keep us from moving toward reconciliation. In The Gift of Forgiveness, Dr. Charles Stanley shows us how to extend forgiveness when grudges run deep and restoration seems out of reach. Life is filled with personal conflicts and confrontations. Will you choose to forgive? The gift of forgiveness will equip you to break free from the chains of bitterness. Don't miss your chance to experience the liberating power of forgiveness with this life-transforming book. Receive a copy when you make a gift of any size to the Ministry of Real Life at jackhibbs.com or by calling 877-777-2346. Order now. Life is full of fear, doubt, and worry. The more you listen to and see the world today, the easier it is to feel hopeless and helpless. Amidst the confusion, a voice of hope has emerged. The Real Life Network. Founded by Jack Hibbs, the Real Life Network is a free digital media platform, void of the noise of secular media that attack people of faith. Click on the QR code or sign up for free at reallifenetwork.com. Fast forward your faith. Welcome to Real Life Radio with Jack Hibbs. God's Word never will return void. God's Word is spirit, it's power, and it has its effects. God did not give us Bible prophecy to scare us, but to prepare us. You are the light of the world, Jesus said. You are the salt of the earth. How does that happen? Jack Hibbs truly believes we are living in some of the most exciting days in history which brings some great opportunities to share with the world a powerful, no-nonsense presentation of the gospel to this generation who are searching for answers and truth. Will you stand with us in sharing this message in real and practical ways? 
we ask that you commit to support Real Life and the teachings of Jack Hibbs with a gift of your choosing. Simply go to jackhibbs.com. And there, you can simply follow the instructions of how to give a one-time gift or a recurring gift. If you would prefer to call, our toll-free number is 877-777-2346. Again, that's 877-777-2346. And of course, you can write us. Our address is Real Life with Jack Hibbs, Box 1273, Chino Hills, California, 91709. Your gift will be faithfully put to work because it's our desire that through Jesus Christ, you will know real life.